Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Strumlaw. I'm the Vice President of the Peace Programs here at the Carter Center, and welcome, uh, welcome all to uh, the role of new technologies in, in, in waging peace. Uh, I should acknowledge our President and CEO, John Hardman, is down in the front row. Um, an esteemed colleague has come back for this occasion, Larry Frankel, I see in the back. And so um, we're delighted to see uh, both the, L the senior citizens and the <laughs> new leadership of tomorrow here. So particular welcome to the younger members of this audience. Um, conversations which we have periodically here at the Carter Center gives us an opportunity to talk about our work to our friends and neighbors in the Atlanta area, although I gather the Wallace Community College uh, is a little further away than our Atlanta area, so we're welcoming some from a bit of afar. Um, we encourage you to learn more about the Carter Center's conversations by going to our website at uh, www.cartercenter.org slash conversations, and while you're there, take a look at the whole website, because that gives you a, an idea of the range of our work. Uh, tonight's uh, event is being uh, webcast, so that uh, we have quite an audience, I'm told, from Deb Hakes, who's really helped facilitate this meeting from our public information office, that there have been calls from teachers and others who are interested in how science and technology communications technology we'll be talking about might be of interest to students in various uh, systems around uh, the state and region. Uh, it does lead me to say beware of what you say when we do questions and answers because this is not uh, Snapchat. You, uh, you, you go on record here and you're going to be there forever. So uh, that's always for young people particularly a good piece of advice, I think. Um, after opening our discussion, we'll take uh, audience uh, questions via the microphones that are uh, up there. Question and answer, we're notionally thinking about starting around 745, which would leave me uh, uh, and our my colleagues, uh, three colleagues, to talk among ourselves for a few minutes and then invite you to, to, to join in with your questions and comments. Before I introduce um, my three colleagues, whose uh, uh, bios are in the, your packets, by the way, so if I run on a little bit long here in this introduction, you can read up on their background. I'll give you a little reference myself before they start. Uh, but uh, Connie Moon Sahat, who's right next to me, Christopher uh, McNabo and Sh Sean Deng are, are three uh, uh, young uh, professionals from the peace program who are most informed and working the hardest in trying to make this new technology relevant and useful to our work. Uh, one thing I must ask you to do is to please uh, turn off your cell phones if you have them on. Let me ask you, just to start this conversation a bit, how many of you uh, own cell phones? Could I just see a show of hands? <laughs> now, I can't, the younger ones don't count, but how many of you, when President Carter was president, happened to own one of these little devices? Right. 78 was the first cellular do network that was put in in Chicago in the United States. Now, that's not so long ago. Today, there are we think Connie's figure is six billion of these little devices. You know, I have seen that we're gonna hit seven billion before long. There's nothing like this has ever happened before in the realm of communications. When I was a kid, there were only two billion people on the planet, for heaven's sakes. Now, seven billion, and we've got six to seven billion of these things with everybody talking to everybody else. That's extraordinary change in the human condition. That's communication. How many of you own smartphones? That's information. You know, you have more computing power in these little hand jobs than you would in, in, in one of those big univacs back when I was a kid. Uh, and you can, as you well know, Google anything. And what's more, people know where you are. It's not just Google Maps, it's Google monitoring. We all know this problem. So we have this joint com of communications, data collection and processing uh, in information working simultaneously in an unprecedented uh, extent. And the question tonight for us is how is this affecting the Carter Center's work in the fields of human rights, democracy, and conflict resolution? Let me just say a couple of words about how we think about our challenges in waging peace. 
Waging peace for us is waging politics. It's resolving conflicts by nonviolent, peaceful means through compromise, negotiation. You can't do that if you don't have politically capable states. You know, I don't take anything away from my health colleagues who are eradicating disease or eliminating disease, or those who work in education like my wife, or those who work in agriculture as the Carter Center did. But if you don't have politically capable states to manage those changes, then you can't get the negotiations to solve the problems to keep waging peace real and meaningful for the rest of us. The hard reality that we're all facing is that our political and social institutions evolve much, much more slowly than the things we'll be talking about with regard to the tools of, of, of communication and information technologies. There is a theory out there that social knowledge, that is the big data that can be mined for indications of trends uh, in the health field if Google can, can, can mine big data and forecast the outbreaks of epidemics before um, the CDC can, that may be progress. At the same time, what does it mean for uh, governance and for privacy? And you know what we're up against with regard to the NSA these days. So harnessing social knowledge for positive purposes is a background of the mind problem that sort of is behind all of our work that we're doing on very more narrow problems. You'll hear specifics tonight, but I wanted to put this in a little broader context because we, we, we humans you know, have been around for 60,000 years, at least this strain of us that came out of Africa 60,000 years ago. I've just been reading this, this, this book by Ian Morris, the anthropologist out at Stanford called Why the West is One for Now. And he says, you know, we've gotten this far, okay, but millennials, you youngsters here, in the next 30 years could hit a confluence of factors that have to be managed by politically capable states in the five great areas of climate change, epidemics, mass movements of populations, failed states. Um, if we can't figure out ways to understand what the problems are in ways that allow for us that reach compromise and understanding waging peace becomes very, very difficult. So tonight, to start this off, we will have Connie Moon Sahat uh, discuss uh, democratic election standards and the software and hardware of the more rapid and comprehensive and quick monitoring of complex election developments and the obligations that states are or are not fulfilling in order to advance credible democratic governance. Chris McNabbo will deal with the problems in Syria where social networking mapping has given us a much better understanding of the correlation of forces in that terrible conflict and whether or not the climate is right or not for peace. But he can explain the implications of his work, which is so significant. And Sean Deng, who has been uh, as our um, uh, program associate in, in, in China program, has been working on the technology and the communications of China and China with the rest of the world to give us some sense of how China's evolving role as a global power, which has really been a phenomenon since President Carter's presidency. We forget how small a factor in world politics China was 30 years ago. And now that it's the second biggest economy, that's all happened in a generation, along with the mass changes within China, like migration and other things. What makes these three um, Peace wagers, so interesting to me. I say that uh, if waging peace is for the purpose at the Carter Center of building hope, these are the architects of building hope. Each three of these technologically savvy young professionals started their careers, and this is a point for the students in the midst, by learning about political and social factors. Connie Moon Sahat did her PhD on the political changes happening between the two Germanys within a social and cultural context, so that she is really an area specialist first and foremost, and took a BA at Berkeley, as you can see from her biography, in fine arts, or art history, excuse me, art history. Chris McNabbo, uh, uh, an Arab speaking, lived in the Middle East for 15 years, uh, understands the politics and societies of the Middle East first, and then learn the science and technology as he got older, and largely since he's been to the Carter Center here, to do his mapping work. Sean Deng, who does so much of the science and technology work for our China program, 
is an Arabist trained by um, the this, this, this School of International Service in Beijing on the, the politics and dynamics of the Arab world. And now, of course, he knows the more confounding politics of America, having been lived here for several years. So I'd like Connie to begin the conversation tonight by talking a little bit about ELMO and DES, Connie. It's a, it's a bit of an esoteric subject, but I think you can make it intelligible to this wonderful audience who's before us. Um, I'll try. So maybe just before I, pe I can begin on the specific technology that I just wanted to introduce you tonight, um, I would like to cover just a little bit about what, what is democratic election observation to begin with. And so just to take a little bit of a step back, it's this question, you know, what makes for a democratic election? Um, this is maybe something that we intuitively know since this is, you know, we're accustomed to that. Um, but in fact, it, there's many different components to what a democratic election entails. The Carter Center has identified actually 21 obligations, um, duties, uh, ideals, these components of what makes for a democratic election. So for an example, um, equal suffrage or the idea that you should have access to information. There are these principles that we've distilled and uh, in agreement, basically, we've, we've drawn them from a large body of public international law. So this is not something that we've created out of our own sort of heads, but looked at a body of international law and practices um, that have been accepted by countries across the world and tried to kind of figure out how to summarize them. So that, if those are the components of a, of a democratic election, then where does the technology come in? Um, in observation, um, an election observation, basically, some basic principles for you to know is that the Carter Center, like many international organizations, we don't go where we're not invited. So we're invited to countries, uh, specifically with the purpose to try and help them understand, you know, was the election, did it, is an upcoming election, is it, is it, how is it measuring against these international um, obligations or principles? And so um, we go where we're invited. Uh, we uh, use this body of legal um, standards against which, um, which a country themselves also have assented to. We're not trying to measure any country against um, principles that they haven't themselves accepted. And just trying to assess legal framework, assess the media, assess this, the, um, the framework, if you will, um, for that particular political um, environment. Um, so, you know, we have these, these long-term um, observers on the ground, we have political analysts, we have legal analysts. Um, how can technology help us? Um, we have one particular tool that we call ELMO, which actually stands, uh, is derived from election, E-L, monitoring, M-O. Um, and it also is kind of a cute short way to summarize it. But basically, um, um, our observers who go on the ground uh, they have lists, uh, uh, questionnaires, checklists, if you will, to help answer questions that can uh, give us information about these, about how a specific election, how a specific framework is performing. Um, so um, um, you can, this particular tool, Elmo, um, it's available via tablet, uh, via SMS now, um, directly online um, if a person has access to the browser and they have a special account. They can answer these checklists for us. And then basically that data, and we, as we saw in Nepal just recently here in November, in real time, we're able to see um, on election day on um, November 19th, we saw across the country instant data that told us, for example, when all the polls opened and our observers were there, what percentage of the ballot boxes were empty. And so having this rapid um, data, this access to it, and the ability to to get that from, from regions in Nepal where, where honestly we didn't think they even had G coverage or any kind of coverage, um, was, was an amazing um, experience to be able to say, we can actually have a pulse on how the specific polling stations, how these specific um, area, regions of the country are performing um, instantaneously. Maybe as just a kind of close out to that, um, I can just sort of mention and say that, so Elmo is an example of, uh, of a certain number of data gathering tools um, where you can, you can have people that are social scientists, 
that are politically um, uh, sort of aware or experts be able to help shape a technology to help us answer these questions. Um, can we measure an election or election framework against a democratic uh, standards and obligations? And I think the question is, yes, there is this amazing opportunity with um, technology as it currently stands. Um, but I think we can go ahead and highlight, too, that you know, technology is um, ambivalent. And I think, as, as, as some of the points that John was raising, that if there are opportunities, there's also challenges. Perhaps I would even say that for, um, technology is a little ambivalent. And so to continue to, to think about what it means to shape a particular technology for peace, you know, what does it mean to, to shape a technology for democratic elections for this purpose, I think it does require, and it will continue to require, a body of technologists, a body of um, political experts to be able to come to a table and think, here's all this data, this abundance of data, which, uh, which is perhaps the, the gift and the curse of the early 21st century. How do we... How do we make sense of it, and how do we use that for, um, for peaceful purposes? Chris, why don't you give us another little glimmer of how this technology works when you have a really bad situation? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think Connie hit the nail on the head with saying an abundance of technology. Um, when we, we take a look at um, a conflict or a failed state or, or some chaotic environment, um, previously we we had to rely on networks of individuals in the country or personal contacts who share information with other people and more and more and eventually the information gets out to the international community but that's essentially a game of telephone and uh, and by the time the international community gets the information it's it's been distorted it's been passed through a whole bunch of hands and and it's limited uh, now uh, as Connie was saying also the the blessing and the curse of, of modern technology is that we have too much information. Um, Syria right now is, is one of the first conflicts that's taken place in a truly connected environment. And, and by many estimates, there have been uh, about 500,000 videos that have been uploaded. 500,000? 500, 500,000 just videos, not to mention the tweets and Facebook posts and blog posts and the Flickr photos, just everything, just the videos, that subset, about 500,000 related to the conflict. So m making sense of that information is just, it's a monumental task, and it's, it's one that the, the international community right now is really um, struggling to keep up with. And uh, what does that new technology mean for, for the conflict? Well, one, there's the opportunity for, for additional information. Uh, there's the problem uh, as it relates to too much information, but also, um, the, the connectivity of citizens in a conflict is, is altering the way that the conflict plays out. So it's not just that we have an opportunity to view how a conflict is, is happening and what's going on in each place. Uh, um, you know, previously we'll get rumors of, of some event, now we'll get uh, three different videos from three different angles of it because people have smartphones and they'll pull it out when, uh, when protesters are being arrested. Um, so that, that connectivity enables people within the conflict to connect with one another, and it changes how that plays out. So um, in, in Syria, the, the Carter Center has tracked the creation of um, 5, 000, over 5,000 armed groups and military councils in Syria. They're not all in existence today. They change. Some are absorbed. But uh, that proliferation of, of organizations can only come about because of the increase in connectivity between people. Groups of, of fighters that would otherwise have remained completely anonymous in the middle of the country can now broadcast their existence and their message to the rest of the country and the rest of the world and receive um, aid from, from parties that are interested in funding them and can receive um, uh, support from, from locals that are interested in joining them. And it, it, it makes the conflict yet even more complex. Um, but then I, you know, I like to, to focus on the opportunities of, of using this information to, to try and uh, inform peace builder, inform humanitarian organizations, um, instead of now humanitarian and aid organizations and peace builders, negotiators, operating on scant information, they know exactly where um, incidents have happened in the country. They know the need. And, 
and they get it on a regular basis. They get almost too much of it. So, um, so that's how we're, we're seeing it affect Syria, Syria just being the first case of such a conflict. Um, we can be sure that it, as connectivity increases and engagement with social media increases along with it, um, we'll see a lot more of this in the future. So um, the Carter Center trying to, to tackle this problem right now is, is good. We're with the rest of the world and hanging on by our fingernails, but uh, the, the better a job we do right now, um, the better we'll be able to handle this sort of conflict in the future. Thanks, and, and uh, Sean, since uh, China is everywhere today, um, the big change in the world, uh, what would you like to add to this conversation so far? Sure, I would like to begin my introduction with giving you a few numbers to consider. Uh, today, China has 564 million internet users, and that's 50 million more than uh, the previous year, which was 2012. Dr. Shimla opened the, uh, the conversations with asking people, everybody here, if you have cell phones. Uh, China has the world's largest cell phone population, and it's also growing at double digits. Uh, in terms of social media, China has over 300 million, to be exact, 309 million microblog users uh, as of the end of last year. Uh, microblogs, as you can uh, see in the handout that we gave you tonight, uh, are basically the Chinese version of Twitter. And there's so many microbloggers uh, in China that the government is now forced to take microblogging and the internet in general with full seriousness. So what does that mean? That means the government is now uh, governing the internet and governing by it. This is a new development in China that's not heard of uh, 10 years ago or even just five years ago. Because of the sort of the overflow or overabundance of information, um, there are a lot of people, a lot of opinion out there that we do really have to understand. And the implication to what we're doing here at the Carter Center and the reason why you know, uh, we should care and all of you should care about this is that the relationship between China and the US, as Dr. Schumel pointed out earlier, is arguably the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. And it is extremely important for people in the US, and for that matter, all over the globe, to get a pulse to really understand exactly how Chinese young people or Chinese internet users are thinking. And that is a gap that still needs to be filled in today's um, academia and in today's uh, civil society, in today's international community. We simply don't have a way or a, or a, a um, reliable insight that would really inform decision makers of how Chinese internet users are, th are, are, are uh, thinking in terms of this relationship with the US uh, or its rising nationalism, uh, their concerns with uh, civic issues, uh, their concerns with uh, China's own social transformation. I'll give you two very quick examples of how the government today is using the internet to govern and to governing and, and governing it, the internet itself. Earlier this year, when the disgraced Chinese senior official Bo Xilai was put on trial in Shandong province, the government decided to uh, webcast, like we're, what we're doing tonight, uh, the trial. But not through video, not on TV, not on radio, but through the microblog. And people are following the official microblog account. It's like an official Twitter account of the local court. And that has created an unprecedented credibility for the central government. People are suddenly believing what's being published on the official Twitter account, uh, or the official microblog account, Weibo account uh, in China. The second case uh, I'll share with you is last year, uh, an official, a local government official, uh, was caught on camera for wearing a very expensive watch, Rolex Omega, I don't remember the brand, but it's a very expensive watch that's obviously you know, beyond his uh, ability to purchase. And uh, that photograph was circulated millions of times or retweeted, in the, I guess, in the Twitter or, uh, 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 um, terminology uh, in the, on the Chinese web sphere. What happened was that the government then was reviewing, launched a sort of investigation on this official and found out that he indeed was corrupt. 
And this incident alone triggered the government's own response to how to fight corruption or how to contain corruption by using microblocks. So after that incident, we observed, we witnessed a um, large growth, a very uh, quick growth uh, of government agencies setting up their own microblogging accounts, trying to monitor uh, you know, what their officials doing uh, and what you know, are people talking about in terms of you know, whether they've spotted uh, corrupt behavior or whether they you know, saw another picture of people wearing uh, either watches or clothes that they probably cannot afford. Uh, so that's my introduction. And um, uh, in terms of what we're trying to do now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the China program at the Carter Center has been during the past decade uh, trying to monitor political development in China uh, through the internet, through the, a web platform that we've been developing for uh, over a decade. And moving forward, because of the importance of the relationship between China and the U.S., we're trying to really monitor uh, Chinese perception of the U.S. by looking at internet sentiment, by looking at internet opinions, uh, trying to fill that gap of understanding in terms of mutual perception, mutual understanding. So that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. I'd, I'd like to take the moment, uh, if, if I could, to stand back before we get into some of the more details of these uh, three interesting presentations, which I hope you found uh, interesting and will stimulate some questions. Uh, the Carter Center is a non-governmental organization, an, 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 an impartial, independent, um, nonpartisan organization. But President Carter has very strong values. And his strong values uh, in support of uh, the basic in inherent equality of all human beings, the founding principle of the republic, uh, gets played out often in his talks and speeches to us. It also got played out very dramatically in Johannesburg, South Africa this morning with the memorial service for Nelson Mandela. Uh, President Carter admires, is very close to, and is very much in the same spirit with the kind of forgiveness respect for all individuals, promotion of inclusive societies that compromise and respect the dignity of all. Those are values which are often presented as Western values uh, that reflect a narrow national interest. Uh, Nelson Mandela, by attracting 90 countries to that uh, memorial service, is a reminder that something is appealing to those universal values but they're not uncontroversial in specific contexts. The Carter Center can't go in and really engineer change, but it can monitor and assess and evaluate. I was wondering maybe in sequence if Connie would say a few words about how we deal with the issue of, is this election observation work just a reflection of America's peculiar interests and values or is it truly rooted in universal obligations? Is it really the fact that governments believe what they say? The United States has stood for inherent equality since the founding document and the Declaration of Independence, but as we all know from the celebration of Gettysburg just a week or so ago, uh, Abraham Lincoln had to revert back to that defining declaration because our Constitution enshrined slavery which is hardly inherent equality. It's a contradiction in terms. We see contradiction in terms all over the place. Connie, if the Carter Center goes around and draws attention to those gaps between rhetoric and reality or principle <laughs> and practice, can we get away with it? And does it have any effect? And what do you say to this universal values issue? <clears throat> I mean, I think, so um, I, I definitely think that we are speaking of international and universal values when it comes to democratic election observation. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these obligations that the Carter Center has helped identify these 21, they are definitely rooted in, in public international law. So not something that, you know, has just been assented to by one or even two countries, you know, over 90 what, associated with the United Nations in many different contexts, uh, accepted in many different treaties um, and across, um, you know, just across time. Um, but as to, you know, um, I don't know, I, I, perhaps uh, maybe the easiest way out of it is to say that democracy is also an aspiration, right? And so, um, you know, I think we're also keenly aware that even in our own context, we are practicing democracy. Can we be better? Definitely. Um, do we always meet the 
the, um, the obligations, these treaties that we ourselves have assented to, mm, you know, probably not 100% of the time. And so that's why observation is so key, that you know, we, would, um, we have these, um, these situations where countries have invited one another to say, come, you know, observe us, help us to improve our own process, help us to reach that aspiration. And I think that um, this uh, idea of these universal values of democracy, there is this constant vigilance, I think, perhaps, that is required of peace work. And so that it can't be the to, it can't be said that you know that you've received see the the gold star of uh, of democracy right if you happen to have one good election. So. The, the 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 assumption buried in this is the more data you have, the more that these elections can be comprehensively evaluated across thirty or forty sort of criteria very quickly that people can understand from a common sense standpoint because they're in the. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they're in the covenants of political and social rights. People are beginning to understand this because they're communicating so much about them. That will reinforce the credibility of our opinion on an issue like that. Mm -hmm. In the case of Syria, where cynicism prevails, Chris, I mean, the, 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 the narrow national interests, the, the, the sectarian bitterness and violence, you just want the violence to stop. Um, do values have any role in this process, and how does your monitoring of these deployments and, and, and atrocities on the ground uh, play into the diplomatic discourse, or doesn't it rel relate at all? Why don't you give us a little flavor of where you think this kind of aggregation of data is going politically, if anywhere? Uh, a true aggregation of, of data coming out of Syria will... Um will kind of wash over a lot of these political biases that you see. You, you, you mentioned the sectarianism, you mentioned the political differences, and, and there's a huge proxy element in Syria as well. But when, we, when we're able to hear just the everyday Syrian voice, you don't see that. That's kind of the anomaly. And we've got 500,000 videos, and who knows how much extra social media information the um, the extreme viewpoints, whether it be political or anything, um, they're, they're the real outliers. Uh, nobody can really coordinate that many videos for some nefarious purpose or, or misinformation. And, and if they get that many people saying the same thing altogether, then that's not misinformation. Right. That's a social movement. Right. So, um, so we can uh, we can get a, a better, more nuanced understanding of of the average Syrian, and, uh, and hopefully, through that, respond to that average Syrian and the majority. We don't have to, to worry about what the silent majority is that's being drowned out by the various guns going off in the country. They're, they're there. They're on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And, um, and hopefully, you know, my, my hope is that with the advent of, of this new technology and the increased connectivity, um, it'll bring uh, a, a more, um, a, a better focus on those universal human rights and, and common elements that exist. But that's a hard, it's a hard question, so you have to excuse me, colleague, because I, I get carried away thinking about this, but let's, I'm sure people are going to wonder about the 500,000 videos. Is there a way to filter those videos for the kind of either value or correlation of forces issues that are of concern to you. Can you make sense out of that? Do we have the techniques to do that now? Uh, those, technique, those techniques are still being built. Um, with the English language, we have speech-to-text uh, technology. And, and we can, for example, if, if this video of this conversation uh, were to be run through these, these programs, we'll be able to get a transcript of everything that's said. That doesn't exist for Arabic. It doesn't exist for, for many other languages, and it's not perfect. So, so when when somebody tweets something, yes, that's it's it's readable and it's understandable um, as a big data um, data point. But it's 140 characters. And you can't really get too much nuance through all of this. Um, the the tools to understand everything in an automated way are being developed, but but a lot of uh, what we do at the Carter Center and what the international community has been doing in order to understand this has been um, through selective crowdsourcing and through brute force to try, to try and get to those voices. Mm -hmm. um, the, the technology that exists can get us a, a large um, 
distance, a, a good distance towards that end goal, but um, more needs to be done. More certainly needs to be done on China too, Sean. I don't want to, I'd, I'd like to continue this a little bit longer, but I need to get you to sort of weigh in a little bit because one of the puzzling things about the emergence of China is that it comes from a kind of an ethnic nationalism or a civilizational nationalism that's not part of this universal discourse that Connie refers to. You know, the kind of diversity that prevails in South Africa that we celebrate with Mandela and his willingness to be all inclusive or in the United States is very different from the Chinese history, the Chinese outlook. Is China going to be, um, to use the old term, a responsible stakeholder as you foresee on this value issue or is it going to be a challenger to the prevailing sort of idea that Connie was articulating about universal values. Where are they on that? Um, I think in terms of values, China is definitely uh, very assertive these days. It has become increasingly assertive during the past uh, three decades, I would say, since present current normalized relations. Uh, 30-some years ago, China was in need of getting the world to really recognize its existence and to agree with its own development path. But today, because of China's you know, over 10% on average growth during the past three decades, it now has that kind of confidence in not only its economic model, but also its political model and its value systems. So I wouldn't say that China is ready to challenge the universal values, but it will definitely stick to its own interpretation of what it means to be universal and what it means to be uh, you know, global in that sense. So that would be my... my, my. And, and is it likely that we will be able to use our uh, eyes and ears on the kind of impulses that you were describing earlier of these communications in the internet constantly to make a sense uh, for ourselves of which way uh, these values are evolving or not evolving? Are we going to be able to aggregate that data and analyze it, or are the Chinese going to make it so difficult? Because there are always stories in the papers. I'm sure students have been, been reading them of the clampdown and the uh, denial of access to information rather than the opening up of information. I think so, definitely. There, is, uh, there exist great opportunities for outsiders and insiders in China, too, to really understand exactly what is the contemporary Chinese uh, culture or value system. Chris mentioned earlier that uh, you know, there are 500 video clips posted on the Syrian internet. 500,000. Oh, 500, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, in China, uh, according to the government's own statistics, it's three million uh, articles published by internet users themselves on the public sphere. So this does not include your, uh, for example, Facebook you know, messages and you know, instant messages. These are blogs that are published on the internet. It's three million, uh, I think it's per year. So there is a lot of information out there for us to analyze and for us to, to, to monitor. And when responding to your earlier question, Dr. Jim Law, uh, I think we use the term China, but China is not uh, a sort of a, a unity that, that we, can, we, can, we can treat. It's, it's comprised of you know, different provinces, different you know, local economies, and most importantly, different thoughts and different ideas. If you look at the Chinese government's own interpretation of the Chinese value system, you see you know, a trendy term these days is called China dream, but how do you define China dream? The government would like to say that you know, this is the great rise of the Chinese civilization sort of from a state's perspective. But to the ordinary people in Shanghai and Beijing, China dream means breathing cleaner air. It's very straightforward. It means having the opportunities to send their kids to schools that are with better teachers, to have the opportunity to um, you know, get a job regardless of uh, where your family is from or you know, who do you know in the government. So I think only by looking at internet um, sentiments and public opinion on, online can we actually understand, can we really accurately understand uh, the value system of contemporary China and where that is headed. I've tried to give you a little flavor in this early conversation of the combination of the information and, and, and communication capacities that are emerging that can be of use to us while not losing sight of our core values. I'd like to invite any of you who would like to have a question to us, um, rise and use one of the microphones now because I am on schedule, according to my masters here. So I, I see a couple of individuals rising. 
Yeah, you're closer. I'll take you first. <laughs> Thank you. And please uh, identify yourself if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Spence Lewis. I uh, specialize in infectious disease in Africa. And uh, I have a consultancy, KWSL Consultant Researchers. We specialize in community health and plant science. What I'm concerned about, we're speaking about inclusion and references to the Constitution of the United States. And everyone has put that in context of their statement. But what I'm concerned about is that the African point of view, historically and now, is not represented on this panel. And uh, there's a great deal of technology that is going on, particular with uh, phones, mobile phones, and so forth, particularly for tracking medical problems. And one of the problems with Africa, it's a very sick country. 3,000 children die a day of malaria and other infectious diseases. So I'm simply concerned as to why Africa, an African representative, is not on this panel. Thank you. I guess I should answer that. Um, and and uh, there's a slit irony in this, and I'll be quite frank. Um, I, I consider myself a South African American. Now, racially, you wouldn't think of me as an African, uh, although if we believe modern genetics, we're all descended from the Rift Valley anyway. We've just come from a celebration of Nelson Mandela. And uh, the, the issue that Mandela raises is, uh, are we one humanity or we're not one humanity? How do we deal with problems regardless of the geography from which we come, the color of our skin. And it's never going to be perfect, but I think there are enough sensitivities and concerns about the African dilemma at the Carter Center across all of our programs. Connie Moon Sahat traces her origins from Korea. Chris McNabo spent his first 16 years of life in the Arab world, even though he comes to the United States. Sean Deng is is Asian as well. Um, Tundi Kakoma is trying to solve uh, Africa's problems in the Sudan for us right now. I think the question is a good one about representation, but it pulls us back to this issue of not only core values, but making sure that we can monitor the implementation of those core values through this use of technology to give us some, 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 some confidence that a, a fairness is prevailing. Mandela was described himself as having a stubborn sense of fairness he inherited from his father. Um, and as we went through the ceremony this morning to remind ourselves of that, I think it was the message for all of us. I, I, I thought the question might less be representation of the continent as a whole, but of particular problems and peoples within the continent because of its diversity. But we have to be able to filter those problems and set our strategies for dealing with them, recognizing that all people are equal and we're all equally able to make value judgments and hold those to scrutiny, to evaluation by others, and to reach a consensus and move forward. So that's a little bit of a wordy long answer to why the representation here isn't global, but common sense will tell you we deal with the talent we've got. But can we assure you that we're open to those concerns from Africa? You bet. May I just briefly comment? Yes, sure. Yes. Um, I can appreciate, but most of the people that are suffering in Africa are not of Caucasian background. They are very black people, high melanin content. So I think it's important that these people and these children that are not dying are not 3,000 white babies in Africa. They are 3,000 black babies. So, uh, and politically, in Africa, the political representation of Caucasians is very high between their own countries in Europe and in the United States, as you so rightly say, and uh, in other parts of the world where there's a European diaspora. This is not the case. It's very disjo disjointed. This is not the case. Thank you, Close. No, thank you, and, and as I said at the beginning, and I won't belabor this, maybe my colleagues want to say another word, but you're not gonna deal with the problems of disease and poverty without the resolve and capacity of political institutions. As President Obama said so eloquently, it's not the, 
strong men is needed in Africa, strong institutions, and that's going to take time and effort. Is the Carter Center committed to seeing those emerge so that those kids get better care and treatment? After all, we do have major health programs that are operating in Africa. That's the other side of our shop. It's the biggest business that we do. Yes, is it enough? No. It's not going to succeed unless we move on the same front simultaneously. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to add, but I'd like to take the other question if not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say congratulations on uh, your intelligence and your uh, innovation in developing these things that you're working on. Uh, Thank um, you. I'm quite impressed, and as I'm sure much of the world is as well. My name is Jim Cavanaugh. I'm a freelance writer. Uh, my first, if, if you would indulge me, I have two questions on different subjects. Uh, the first question is for uh, Mr. Deng. To what extent have you observed or is the Carter Center concerned about the danger of the Chinese government or other gov governments for that matter uh, reversing uh, the data and uh, using it to locate, identify, and persecute dissenters? Would you like me to address now or? That, that's oh, my first sure, question. Of course. Yeah. Um, I think you asked a, a great question. Um, in terms of the power of social media and the data that it generates, it's definitely a double-edged sword. It allows people, the public, to voice their concerns more freely than before. But it also allows the government to leverage that data. Uh, I'm not sure you know, uh, what I'm referring to in regards to re reversing the data, but the government definitely is using that data trying to monitor exactly what's going on within society. And um, um, there is the danger. But I think we do have to realize that it also presents a huge opportunity for not only the government itself, in this case the Chinese government itself, but also the citizenry in general, to build a bridge between the two, to establish a channel that the current political institution does not allow or does not, has, uh, is lagging. Um, if you look at how you know, the Chinese government officials these days respond to sort of citizen outcries and concerns, uh, many times it's through the social media. Now, do they monitor social media and monitor uh, you know, everything that people says? Uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure. I think they're definitely looking at the big picture, but uh, I just don't have enough data to tell you exactly to what extent and to what level that monitoring is, 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 is happening. But I think if it's happening at the macro level, uh, I see that as more of an opportunity than a danger because you know, that technology is available to all governments. And you know, every single government would like to know more about its public opinion would like to know more about its constituency in general. So, you know, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I would like to, st I, I see that in a positive light, and I, 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 I think that's more of an opportunity than of a danger. Sean, I think uh, Chris wanted to add a point. Yeah, if I could. Um, uh, Facebook was not legal in Syria up until relatively recently. Um, and, and it's thought that it was made legal in order to enable the government to, to monitor dissenters and, and crack down on dissent. Obviously, the government has not succeeded in cracking down on dissent in Syria. Um, and, and that's one of the, the main points to take away from, uh, from this increase in citizen engagement online. It's an asymmetrical um, issue. We've got thousands upon thousands of citizens for every government employee. And uh, if, if, uh, if they want to, you know, they can, they can talk, and they will talk. And yes, some people will monitor them, but uh, uh, the, the resilience of the population and its ability to communicate is, is, is really something that's it's very difficult for, for any government, however powerful, to, to truly control. You're just imagining how different Tiananmen Square might have turned out had Twitter existed at the time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your second question? My second question uh, is for Dr. Sahat. Uh, how does the development of, of ELMO and the technology that, that's being, being used for election monitoring, how is it affecting the Carter Center's 
response to perceived irregularities when they do occur. Mm. <clears throat> I'm not sure. Mew, could you maybe try to elaborate a little bit more? I just want to make sure I answer the question. Sure. I mean, exactly. uh, presume if I understand the technology correctly, mm -hmm. uh, the data is transmitted to some central hub mm -hmm. instantaneously, mm -hmm. and uh, monitors there with the Carter Center can look at the data and say, well, there's something going on mm -hmm. in such and such a place. Mm -hmm. Do you then send monitors in trucks to go and, and oh, wave your fingers at the, at the <laughs> elector, uh, election officials, or what yeah. happens? So, I, I mean, I think basically, um, so I think your question uh, was uh, one of like, how is it tran transforming our current practice, for exactly. example? Um, and so I'll answer them in a small and then maybe a very big way. Um, so in a very um, small way, no, we don't go ahead and immediately send out, um, send out someone, for example, in that particular instance of, let's say, fraud was observed. Um, because it is this um, principle of, our, of election observation, of international election observation, that we don't interfere with the process, that we're trying to basically uh, be there to assess. And then also, um, it's, it's kind of hard to hard to emotionally respond to this perhaps on the ground, but that we believe that it's through the, um, the collection of this data with a long-term perspective with the, in the context of the entire legal framework that we'll be able to, at the end of an election, we put out a preliminary statement and then after several months, a more advanced statement. Um, because, uh, for example, there may be one instance of fraud in this particular um, that we've witnessed. But in the context of an entire country, once we have all of the data, we may realize, well, it doesn't, it's not something that we can really, that really made a difference. What really made a difference was actually their laws on not allowing people access to information, for example, right? So I think what it does allow us to do is to hone our questions uh, more so that we can tie them and integrate them with these aspirations, with these obligations that I've, I've uh, mentioned. And that this is, um, tr this is slowly transforming and will greatly transform the impact. I think the kinds of recommendations, for example, we make from our election observations. In a very big way, though, I think that, um, Alma, we hope that will transform um, practices not only within election observation, but within Peace Programs Carter Center overall. Because in the end, as I said, this is a tool that is built with um, people who have human rights sort of uh, knowledge and expertise. Um, and we're integrating with that with the expertise of technologists. So you can imagine there's all sorts of types of problems when it comes to data collection that perhaps would benefit from more on the ground response. And so we're investigating those, ops, um, those uh, opportunities as well. The tools are only as good as the people who use them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, uh, my name is Brent Douglas. I'm a high school senior. Um, now we all know that um, we all know that the, Ameri the purpose of the American government is to um, to protect the citizens' rights and to uphold the Constitution. Now, when you say all the data collection, now who who is monitoring the monitoring, so to say, so saying making sure that that the people's rights that too much information isn't that's being collected isn't infringing on the people's rights. I mean, I mean, you know, you have your LMO system, but who's to say that this this information isn't corrupted and that is being used falsely than what we're being told? Now, who's monitoring them, saying that, you know, what well, everything is as it says? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I can answer, but I think there's probably broader applications for that question as well, because I think at the heart of it, it's a question of transparency in a way, right? I mean. Um, um, you know, whether it comes to specific election observation or whatever data is being gathered, you know, what purposes are um, it being used for? Or exam for example, even um, when it comes to code, which a lot of people don't understand and can't read, and in fact we vote via electronic voting systems as well. How do we know that those systems um, reflect the will of the people, for example? And so there are um, in different spheres, um, practices that try to promote basically the transparency and also ownership of the data. And there are best practices established. So for example, open source code goes ahead and shows to anybody that can 
can read code, and they can also download the code. So our, our software, for example, we have, it is open source. And so people can see um, and compile it on their own and decide, here's what the system exactly does. Does it do what the Carter Center says it does? Does it do what um, we've broadcast it to do? Um, so those are, that's, exam that's an example, one example of transparency that I think that can come into data practices um, if they are well established. And I'm sure that both um, Sean and Chris could speak to that kind of uh, it, it, At least problem. in, um, in, in Syria, the, the issue is exactly transparency. You know, I'm, I'm monitoring what's going on in Syria and you know, who's monitoring me. Well, um, I, can, I can give you a report or give you an assessment of what I've seen through monitoring social media and you can go out and do the exact same thing. I'm not coming across the, the data that I use through any secret ways. It's Facebook posts and YouTube videos and public blogs and it's, it's all out there. So um, I, I think with access to this information, uh, the ability of, of multiple actors to, to, to look at it and, and analyze it is, uh, is, is what's going to keep everybody honest about uh, what is being reported and what, what is being said. And can I actually add on to that? So also then for international observation too, we're not the only group on the ground. Um, and that's actually a key principle of election observation. You want as many groups on the ground as, as possible. So right now, in terms of our current um, um, our upcoming observation in Madagascar. We're partnering with ISA, the Electoral Institute um, for you're Sustainable to, Development in Africa. In Africa Democratic right. Development always, in Africa. That, 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 yeah, the yeah. acronyms. You know, we, and, <coughs> but that's just, we want as many people on the ground there with us, all these other partner organizations who have similar um, goals and aspirations doing the same kinds of observations and we do, um, we do collaborate with them as well. So I do think there is this um, not just one group on the ground doing this work, but multiple groups and so on. Mm -hmm. I think in the case of China, uh, at this point in time, nobody knows exactly which groups within the government are doing the monitoring. And your question of whether the monitors are themselves being monitored or are they held accountable, in the case of China, we don't know. Uh, and that's a very honest answer. We just don't know. But another, uh, I guess, point I would like to raise and potentially challenge you is that we live in a digital age. Uh, we as citizens of different countries all share our privacy, all share information to a much larger extent than we did before or than the previous generation did. When you post your location, what you had for lunch, uh, what you, you know, the movies you watched last night on Facebook or on Twitter, that's, you know, you're sort of giving up a part of your privacy to the entire internet. Uh, now, you can choose your circles or you know, if you're sharing with friends and there are different parameters that you can set. But still, we live in a very different age where privacy also needs to be redefined and re-looked at, re-examined. Mm -hmm. And what implication does that have on the relationship or on the social contract between p the people and the government? I think that is a question that uh, I hope that the students today would really ponder. Uh, a professor of mine in um, undergrad brought up a really good point. He said, uh, I think we all need to recognize that there's a large degree of irony when somebody tweets something negative about the Patriot Act. You know, in, in engaging <laughs> in that way, we are enabling that same monitoring. The business of being a citizen for your generation is going to be a lot harder than it was for my generation. The hope is that you'll have these tools that will allow you to manage that information in a way that allows you to get on with the rest of your life while you're still being a responsible citizen because everybody now wants a say in everything. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. My name is Shana Negron. I'm a media coordinator with CNN. And you know, from experience, we as news gatherers use a lot of social media to cover the news these days. So, you know, with Syria as an example, I can certainly relate to the abundance of information that's out there. Um, a lot of the times when we do cover certain stories or situations um, that were happening in that conflict, we had to be very careful about what we showed, what we reported, 
um, how we verified the things that we put on air. Um, because sometimes you just never knew if someone was using these platforms to advance a certain agenda or to sort of distort what was actually happening on the ground. So I was wondering if any of you all have had any sort of experiences within the purpose of your work um, where any of the sources of information uh, that you were working with maybe tried to distort or kind of, you know, skew certain in points of information for their agenda? And what are some of the steps that you all take to really verify the information that you're using for your work? Uh, absolutely. There are, um, <laughs> there are countless groups in Syria that'll try and um, show themselves as being a little bit bigger than they are and, and more um, capable than they are. Uh, one specific example, um, there was an armed group in Damascus, well, it's still operating in Damascus now, but um, a year ago, in December 2012, they posted a video of uh, themselves with some, um, what are called man pads, uh, man portable surface to air missiles, um, which would be a game changer uh, if they were real. Uh, they were actually training models. And, and yes, we, you know, we, we could have reported on the fact that they have these, uh, these weapons because they're displaying them very prominently. But, but when you look um, at, at that incident as being one point of many, many data points, you'll see that um, no helicopters or airplanes were shot down after they got these, these weapons. And, you know, if they truly had them and they're truly capable of using them, then why are they, why are they not doing so? And uh, another group around the same time uh, posted a video of it in control of a town. And they said, we took control of this town which is near a major city, and, and you would think, wow, you know, this is, this is a major development, until you, again, look at it in, uh, and see how it fits in with the rest of, of your data, and you, you notice that that group used to be operating several miles closer to the city, and that they'd actually been pushed back. So, yeah, they might have run through that town on their retreat, but, but it doesn't really mean too much. Mm -hmm. so, so what we've been doing in order to, to get over this, this um, potential risk for misinformation is uh, trying to comprehensively analyze the aspects of the conflict that we can. So I mentioned there are 500,000 videos, or approximately, of conflict incidents. Um, one of the first things we did is we, we, we partnered with some researchers to help us out, and we took a subset of those videos that relate to armed group formations, be it pro-government, anti-government armed group formations, and, and we, we analyzed that, and so we can see how um, how their networks are evolving over time. And when there's a new formation, what does it actually mean? When there's a split, how does that actually affect the conflict? And, and we use that information, the, the baseline of a large amount of data, to reach our conclusions, and not so much the, the comments and points that were made in, in, in a particular video or, or um, something that happens at, at a particular time. We, you know, we're able to put it in context. And, and say what it means. Can, can I ask you a, que a question? Since this is a conversation, after all, the CNN <laughs> is, uh, is a business. It's getting harder and more expensive to deploy people abroad. You've got this influx of information. You use citizen reporting often in your own reporting. What kind of filters and what kind of confidence do you have in, in judging whether or not what you're getting is, in fact, right? And how do you see this evolving within the organization? If you can say anything about that, it would be interesting to us, I think. Well, I think that for the most part, we just try to be diligent in, I think it's more than just taking in what's said, it's reading between the lines. Um, I, we also have you know, very skilled news gatherers who are either from the region or who have experience in the region. We also have people on the ground. So when we do have major international stories of that magnitude, um, I think that CNN is an organization um, that is different from many others because we are able to get people in there um, where some other organizations cannot. Um, but for the most part, I think that with CNN and with pretty much every other news gathering organization out there, social media is taking over and is becoming really one of the major tools for 
how we do our news gathering. Um, Twitter is pretty much open on everyone's uh, you know, desktops throughout the entire newsroom. And um, in a way, it's, it's making things easier, but at the same time, it does make things mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated when it comes to verifying um, information and making sure that things are correct. But it's something that we, mm -hmm. we balance and we you know, still follow the same strict guidelines of verifying information that we would anywhere else. It's, a, it's an interesting topic, I think, because, I mean, in terms of this whole social media conversation, there's two things that come to mind. One is this skill of data literacy, right? So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you take the information, consider, weigh it, what's more important versus something else? Um, one of the uh, like favorite examples I have is actually from a colleague at George Mason. He teaches a history course, and he uses Wikipedia to do it. And so the assignment is for the students to write an article on Wikipedia, and just, then the real assignment is to write a paper on how that article fared over the course of the semester, right? And one of the students apparently kept on saying, like, I keep on putting my article, it keeps on getting deleted or wiped out or totally, you know, um, you know, totally like someone keeps on like, you know, editing it over. So, you know, what is, what is this process of like uh, good data? How do, you, how, how do you train? How do you train people to be that data literate? But the other part of it, I think, especially with the social media aspect, again, is this question of importance, right? Because if you've got 500 tweets about something, is this a really important issue or not, right? And what about the, the silent, um, the silence, the sometimes deafening silence out of areas where the digital divide is um, uh, you know there isn't any digital media. We have we had a pilot program this uh, this uh, fall in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which the World Bank uh, listed in 2010 as one of the most challenging infrastructures um, in the in the world um, in terms of its uh, the dearth of resources um, for any kind of governance or information gathering. And so we had this SMS Elmo pilot where we were just trying to ask um, our, uh, a group of domestic long-term observers to, uh, to comment on questions related to political security, right? Um, so they used their SMS and tried to, to do this. But, you know, traditionally in these areas to get, which was amazing, to get not over 90 people to submit 400 forms, which in the past, how do you get there? You get people to fly, you get them to ship stuff, and this is like there is no no connectivity in these areas. So, mm -hmm. and, and now if I could, I'll share with you two examples of how the Chinese government does data verification. Uh, one method that's been practiced uh, by a lot of internet service providers, like you know, Sina Weibo, the Chinese version of Twitter, is that uh, they allow people and encourage people to register an account with their uh, national ID number, and then they would verify that person's affiliation, an employer, or you know, if they are a pop star or whatever. So they would you know, gather that kind of, those kind of documentation from that individual and put a little badge on their profile picture that says V, so it's verified. So these people are, at least the public, uh, believes that they are more credible than others. And what they're saying is more uh, you know, automatically verified than what everybody else is saying. Uh, the other method is that China passed a new law recently, I don't remember exactly when, but very recently, uh, that says you know, if you post something on Weibo, a microblog on Chinese Twitter, and you get more than 500 retweets, and it, and it ends up being a rumor or false information, you go to jail. Um, so people are very careful these days about now, this does not include, I, would, you know, I don't think the government would really hunt down people who are just saying, you know, I like this product, but that product ends up to, being a, to be a fake product. I don't think that's included. But for social and political uh, activists, uh, the danger does exist. You know, if you're advocating for a potential cause, or if you're citing you know, what people are saying, but it's false information, it's false citation, uh, then you know, there is the potential for uh, you know, legal action. Uh, now, that is definitely overcorrecting the problem to me. Uh, but you know, I just want to share these examples with you in terms of what's happening in the field. Yeah. Interesting. I think social media here would be very different if that were the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Lilling. I'm <coughs> Axel Lebrun from G3 ICT, the Global Initiative for Inclusive Technologies. Uh, I was curious, I, was, I had a chance to look at what UNOSAT does for disaster relief in countries like Haiti and other places where they have actually crowdsourced pictures automatically linked to satellite imagery. I was wondering if you were using those technologies and if you saw some potential here to actually do fact verification when you monitor conflict and geographical issues. Um, yeah, I use satellite imagery all the time in, in, in order to fact check. You know, I mentioned this, this armed group that uh, said they took control of a village a while ago. It was satellite imagery that confirmed that they had indeed taken control of that village. And um, in, you know, it's, it's not just um, me taking a closer look at, at a lot of these videos or tweets or posts and, and trying to fact check them. It's the activists themselves. You know, I, I think um, I, I find it very, very good that, that media is transitioning to focus more on social media. And I, I feel like uh, that's good because it's owed to these people. Uh, I encourage all of you to go home and, and type in a couple of keywords in Google Translate and then drag and drop those, um, the Arabic results into just YouTube and see what these activists are doing. Um, war footage like this has never existed. People are l risking their lives to, to point a camera down the barrel of a tank um, on a, the daily basis, just all, all the time. And those same activists are very savvy about how they can verify what's going on. You know, if, if they see um, protesters being attacked or they see unlawful executions, they won't just film that. They'll turn the camera around and they'll look for landmarks that can be used you, with satellite imagery to verify their position. They'll uh, hold up a sign saying the date, the time, the location, what's going on. They'll narrate during it. They won't cut the camera so that you would think that things have been spliced together. Uh, they are actively working to ensure that, that these videos can be verified, um, either for, for future prosecutions, for uh, crimes against humanity, or just to really you know, try and get the message out. So absolutely, um, satellite imagery and, and any other means of verification are, are actively being used by all parties. To make a more general point in, in, in support of that, Pre President Carter often makes the uh, observation that if you give people a chance, even in their most impoverished and desperate and isolated circumstances in a rural, rural, poor village of Africa, they have the same values, the same aspirations, the same sense of responsibility that any of us have anywhere in the world, because we're all human beings, we're all part of that human family. That's not a bad sort of back of the mind uh, a point for, for some hope that every time you connect in this way, if, if, you, if, if people think their, their opinions matter, they think their vote counts, they'll make that extra effort if they think that they can, in the case of our health programs, take a gesture that will make their kids safer, they'll do it. They won't do it if they don't think it's gonna work, but they will do it if they think people will take it seriously. So for, by extension, for a small uh, non-governmental organization like ours with high visibility, governments now more and more, that is to say the outside governments or the regional governments that don't want problems in their neighborhood, if we can pr credibly say that this was a free and fair election, they will defer to the process rather than the result and be partisan. There's much less, as it was during the Cold War, you know, that you're either for us or against us. It's how did you get to that outcome, and was that outcome credible to the stakeholders on the ground who are recognized and increasingly its citizens? That's the great historic shift going on, that, that, that more and more we're a human rights-based rather than a sovereign rights-based global community. But governments mediate that, and what we're finding more and more is that if we can give an impartial view, that will have some standing. If we're not credible at that, and that's where the, that's where the technology comes in, because that gives us a little more leverage. You just have more facts, and you've filtered those and analyzed those in a way that's more credible, then you have more authority to persuade people. Let, let the process work itself out. People have gotten imperfect, 
it's, maybe it's going to take a while to self-correct. That's, that's, again, I'm thinking now of the Nelson Mandela message. <laughs> you know, why would that man have spend, spent 27 years in jail and come out and said, you've got to follow the rule of law, even though he was illegally put in jail or unfairly put in jail by an illegitimate system? Because he realized that the process matters. And the opportunity to let that process work matters. But there's got to be oversight. There's got to be an independent oversight. And that's what we can try to prevail. Yes, please. I actually would like to touch on what you just um, said. When you're gathering all this data, and um, this is actually a little more directed to you, Christopher, um, you're, you're giving this to people as independent information. That's kind of how I'm interpreting it. So um, what's the tracking in terms of how that information is being used for peaceful purposes? I mean. What's the communication after you give what you've collected to these different groups and different organizations to see if there's actually been some progress in those areas of conflict? That's uh, a very good question. Um, a lot of the information that we've been um, collecting, gathering, and, and reporting on, uh, we've been providing to a very select group of, of respected international peace uh, builders. Um, either the United Nations or some, some neutral foreign ministries or, or people that are on the ground. And, uh, and we work actively with them to try and to use this information uh, in a, a positive way. So uh, just an example, um, the Carter Center was invited to participate in a, in a media, mediation effort in a localized part of the Syrian conflict. We didn't actually go. Um, there were other mediators there. We, didn't need to complicate the situation, but we provided them with information about what armed groups were operating in the area, what conflict incidents had there been, what generally was the status of forces, as we saw it from, uh, from Atlanta with social media. And uh, the mediators, um, in doing this, we were able to pinpoint one group as being a center of gravity, not just because it had the most subsidiary units and the largest number of fighters, but because after the various uh, armed groups had entered this area, that one grew, and it pulled divisions from, from the surrounding units. So, so we were able to pinpoint them as being a, a good point of contact for a ceasefire, and uh, it was, in fact, that group that signed the ceasefire. So, so we, we try and actively work as much as possible with uh, those who we're sharing the information with. And, um, and you know, I was... I was making a point earlier that, that I think we, we owe it to the people who are generating this information in order to, to let them know that, that people matter, that it's being used, that they're being heard. Uh, we've just recently made the decision to make a lot of these reports public. So uh, I don't know if they're posted yet, but they should be on the Carter Center website soon if you'd like to look at them. Thank you. And if you have any views, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Please. Grant writer for a nonprofit. My background's in anthropology and bioethics. Um, Christopher, I think I might have the counterpart to that question that was just previously asked. Um, in ethnography, you know, there's been a long concern about um, inadvertently providing harmful information to conflicting groups. Even though this, uh, um, you know, the 500,000 videos that you're speaking of, even though this is available in mass, in some ways your work's making it more approachable which can be helpful, but for those who are maybe less well-intended, that approachability could also be a problem. Um, what are your concerns along those lines, and how are those concerns being addressed? Um, we are very, very sensitive to those concerns. Um, I, I could, if I wanted to, gather all the videos that have, have been posted and, and draw on a map where they're being posted from. I mean, this, this information is sometimes available, but but we don't provide that sort of information because then you'll get uh, you know, one neighborhood of a city as being a, a point of origin of a lot of opposition information or a point of origin of a lot of pro-government um, information. And, and that's not at all what's useful to peace builders. It's what's useful for nefarious purposes. So um, in our reports, we don't reference individuals unless they have made themselves very, very publicly known as the leader of um, a, a major organization. Uh, we don't reference very specific uh, 
locations of, actually we, we don't at all reference where um, battalions are uh, in any, any more specific way than a governorate, which is essentially one of the states or provinces of Syria. Um, so we, we provide what is necessary to understand what's happening in the conflict and not too much um, so as to enable any further violence. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job of being very careful with what we provide. Um, again, the, the reports will be online. Let me know if you have any concerns about what we're reporting on. I'll have to go look at them. Thanks. According to my clock, we're supposed to say there's one more question before we begin our adjournment. Is there anyone with any kind of comment that they'd like to make before I uh, close these proceedings? Uh, because uh, we are close to the 8.30 hour, at least the 825 hour. Colleagues, would you like to add anything by way of conclusion? I'd, like to, I'd love to have each of you tell me where you think you'll be 30 years from now, but I'll resist that temptation. <laughs> However, if you wish to do a forecast or two, you're also welcome. But does anyone have any final comments? Because you've been extremely helpful to us this evening. I'm running no? Away. Well, I guess I'll, 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 I'll start. Um, now, I can't imagine where I'll be in 30 years, but you know, I, I guess as a sort of a concluding thought, uh, I think we've touched on a variety of issues, but you know, one thing that really struck me is the, the complex effect of information these days and how careful that everybody must be, not only in the government, because we like to say you know, the government should be responsible for protecting privacies, for protecting civil liberty, and for doing everything. But you know, in the information age, it makes a lot of other groups much more important and much more prevalent in the entire process. Uh, like you know, some of the questions we're, touched, we're, we're touching on, you know, organizations like the Carter Center may have uh, you know, enormous information with regards to what's happening in Syria. And that's hard to imagine, hard to picture 30 years ago. And 30 years from now, I think the power that individuals have with regards to information will only become stronger and much more influential. So, you know, for the students within the audience today, I think that's something that you should really think hard about. And, um, you know, that might mean opportunities for careers, and that might also mean uh, dangers that you have to avoid in the future, either in the public or in the private spheres. So that's just my concluding thought. Um. If I could go off of that, uh, a graduate student contacted me a while ago and asked me to comment on uh, a few subjects covered in his paper uh, uh, that he was writing. I said, well, you know, what's your thesis? And it was something along the lines of social media being a liberation technology. And I uh, unfortunately had to let him down a little bit. I don't <laughs> think it's a liberation technology. I, I mean, it's, it's a tool. It's a double-edged sword. Um, We've highlighted some of the ways in which it can be used for bad purposes. I think, um, I don't know where I'll be 30 years from now, but I hope uh, if wherever I am, it, uh, I will have contributed a little bit into helping uh, this information revolution really become a liberation technology, making it safe for individuals to use and making it, um, well, making governments and society truly uh, responsive to itself and um, you know I, I really do agree that that people matter and this is a tool that can can help make voices heard so um, let's try and make it safe um, and perhaps as a you know sort of final thought that kind of uh, teased off of both of th things that you have both said to um, Chris and I have had actually this conversation before but I um, I think yes Technology is a tool, but I think one of the things that we're hearing uh, through this night is how much also technology is so much more. It's a system. It's uh, it's it's cultural. It has you know to be sucked into a uh, a social media web to is is uh, is to be introduced to a whole lot of um, different kinds of cultural expectations. Um, you know privacy. These types of issues that um, that are all interconnected, and so. Um, when I think about the technology, I, do, I have um, for a while now thought about it in terms of both opportunity and challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
Uh, one of the, the additions I, I would add to that sort of thought now is that there's, um, if there are opportunities and challenges, I think there's also tremendous obligation now to have to do something with this. With this abundance of data, with the ability for people to, you know, to provide so much information at the, at the click of a button or, the, or, or you know, the touch of an iPhone, um, there's so much out there, and I think that in terms of trying to navigate these waters, it now seems to me that there's actually an obligation to do something with this data, especially um, with relationship to the kinds of ideals, the kind of world we want to live in. So I can't even think about what I'm going to be doing 30 years from now. <laughs> The fact that uh, I I will still. the fact that, that that all three of you are going to be working in this in this area and for those objectives is good enough for me. Okay. For me, this has been an evening of building hope. I hope you share that view. I'd like to thank my three colleagues so much for taking the time and effort. You know, they put in long days already, and here they are working this evening, trying to make sense out of what they've been doing in the day with your participation. Thank you very much all for coming. There'll be another conversation, not looking as much forward, but. Next conversation on February 13th uh, at the Carter Center will be a documentary and screening of the human rights abuses during the Argentinian War, Dirty War of 1976 to 83. The discussion that will follow will involve President Carter, who will, was very much involved in trying to protect from human rights abuses back then. Uh, we're playing human rights defense in new ways by this conversation tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been a pleasure to hear my colleagues think aloud about some of these very complex and challenging issues. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you in the next conversation. You guys are